Hello, ROS developers, and welcome to the ROS Developers Podcast, the program, the podcast that gives you insights from the experts about how to program your robots with ROS. This is Ricardo from The Construct, and uh, today I would like to dedicate this episode to the people out there that are thinking about uh, building their own robotics startup. Yes, the, ro- the world needs you. Somebody has to build the robots that we saw in the movies. Those robots that help humans in dangerous environments, uh, like for example the moon or Mars. Those robots that take the hard jobs in their shoulders. Those robots that become our most trusted companions. And if you are thinking about building such a kind of robotics startup, this episode is dedicated to you. And maybe if you don't know how to start to build a robotics startup, the first thing that you have to do is to learn about ROS and robotics. For that, you need to go to the Constructs Online Academy. The Constructs Academy is not like other academies where you passively watch a lecture on a video. In the Constructs Academy, you are going to be practicing from minute number one. Our lessons are practice-based first by using the robot simulations we provide on the cloud. And second, using the remote real robots that we have in Barcelona, to which you can connect from your location 24-7. How cool is that, eh? Well, you will learn all types of raw subjects in our academy, like navigation, manipulation and perception, machine learning applied to rules robots. But also you will learn the basic theories of robotics, like mobile arm uh, kinematics, Kalman filters, robot dynamics and control. All the lessons are practice-based. Forget about uh, doing passive listening to a video lecture, instead, actively practice at the construct. Okay, then uh, today we are going to learn the first experience of a person who built uh, these uh, kind of uh, startups that are building very cool service ROS robots. Let me introduce you, Roberto Guzman, and Roberto is the founder and CEO of a robotics company, uh, it's a ROS-based uh, robotics company that produces many types of service robots. He is a ROS expert, expert and has many years' experience launching service robots to the market. Real service robots. Let's talk uh, to he- with him about the creation of a successful ROS-based robotics company. Welcome to the podcast, Roberto. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me to the Ross Developers Podcast. Yeah, that's the second time, it's right? Second time for me. Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> you were in one of the early episodes uh, where we talk about Ross components, the other the branch. Early, uh, early adoption of, of Ross and the first versions we, we deployed with Ross, I remember. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. great. And today we are going to talk about your... Startup, startup. I don't know if to call it a startup or a company. You you have to clarify this to us. So, uh, when did you start Robotnik, and with how many people? Yeah, we. Well, I, I started uh, Robotnik in 2002. That's uh, 19 years ago. Wow. Uh, initially, <laughs> uh, just two employees. Okay. And uh, having also uh, shown shares from uh, from an industrial company that was investing in us. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. So uh, then we can consider that your company was a startup, right? At that moment, yes, I would say at that moment. At that moment. Like a startup company, yes. Okay. Yes. And then you started with uh, another person, then it was yeah, yourself Rafa, and another Rafa, second one? Rafa is the Randy 
a manager and a co at co present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is the present R and D manager, and he co-founded the, the company with me. Ah, okay, you both. And uh, how many people are you at present? Because two people. Yeah, now now we are sixty person. What? Maybe more. And uh, yeah, we we have uh, we have grown by by bootstrapping principally. We have. Uh, uh, just uh, reinvested the, the, the income, the, the profit of mm -hmm. the, each year in the company and uh, have uh, reached this size with no additional uh, funding. Uh -huh. we, we got, uh, I started initially getting some uh, money that was available for uh, persons that have uh, this uh, employee, unemployee uh, fee or how do, how do you call it? You mean the paro in yes, Spain? Yes, the paro. Uh -huh. uh, some, um, Money you get uh, from unemployment. Yeah, from uh, the government. From the government, and then you have the opportunity to use this money just uh, in a single pay. Ah, payment. yes. And, and with the single payment, you have the you have to start a company. Uh -huh. And I use this money together with uh, with uh, some uh, external investment to start the, the company. Uh huh. That you, when you mean this um, extra money provided by the government as a subsidiary payment, right? Yes, because of yes. then it's your you mean your money? My, 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 uh, your the money. one I had uh, accumulated for, Through, for some years. Several years. And then uh, you can get it in a single payment for starting a company. Uh -huh. Start okay, exactly, yeah. exactly. And uh, then this, uh, I'm, I'm asking you about that because I, I talk on the podcast about how to build a robotics startup. And there is one of the chapters that I talk about getting the initial money to start a company. And I explain the, the, you know, the seed rounds. So we can consider that your like a yeah, that, that, pre-seed, pre-seed. Pre pre right? That's what, what uh, usually is called uh, uh, family, friends and fools. And fools, exactly. That, that, that was the initial, uh, capital. initial capital, but there was no additional round and okay. from, uh, after... Uh, after a few three years, mm -hmm. we started to get uh, profitable, and and then we started returning the money and uh, generating uh, more generating to grow and, and, and just reinvesting the profit. That was ah. a, a, a standard procedure we have followed since this, since this moment. Okay, okay, yeah. So for the audience, you have uh, listened to the chapter three about how to build a robotics startup. Uh, then Roberto. In Robotnik, they use the bootstrap. So they use the fools, friends, and family proceed to start. And then from that point, it, it allowed them to reach profitability and then start using the profits to grow the company, which is called the bootstrapping technique. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. great. Then and, uh, another question. So you didn't uh, require any rounds of investments, and and then you also mentioned that you were profitable in three years. Correct. And then yeah. one question about that: so all the money that you had from the very beginning was enough to lead you along three years, you know, because your startup is a hardware startup that usually requires a lot of money. So how do you manage that? We we started initially addressing. Uh, industrial robotics okay and also more industrial automation and in fact the name of the company the complete name is robotic automation which was uh, uh -huh. addressing the more the automation market so we we started doing uh, some uh, also special machinery uh, industrial robotics uh, and uh, with this we we started the invoicing services for automating uh, product line or installing a robot arm or programming uh, plcs in automation lines uh -huh. and, uh, so it was possible to via via these uh, projects uh, to to get the money to get the money back. And, ah, I see. And so we we didn't start at the uh, focusing on mobile robotics at the when 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 we created the company, but we we did this change very very soon. Very early, very in early there. yeah. Um, we we got um, uh, a project that where we had to automate a forklift. A what? Uh, a forklift. Uh, what is that? A forklift is a uh, uh, transpaleta. It's a, ah, see, sí, transpaleta. Okay, okay. Like, like Sorry, a, my English. <laughs> yeah. And uh, with this uh, ex experience, uh, we started um, entering in R and D projects where our contribution was to our to to provide the mobile robotics part. 
Ah, and, I see. And this was done more and more, and this uh, allowed us to specialize on this uh, on mobile robotics. At the same time, we realized that uh, that this uh, pure industrial automation, we were not that competitive in this area. We, uh -huh. we were to uh, to quoting to some uh, industrial actor and. We were together with other 10 companies that were offering the same service as we, as we were. And then in mobile robotics, we had a clear difference and, and was something unique at that time. Uh -huh. And so we focused on this, uh, uh, this direction and we did what, what is called uh, pivoting uh -huh. uh, of, the, of the company. And so after 2008, 100% uh, of our business was uh, related with mobile robotics. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, yeah. So now you, you have explained there a lot of concepts there, but the, the one in, I think it's very, very interesting is the pivoting that you mentioned yes, because you started. It okay, yeah, yes, yeah, so perfect. It, and it's uh, the change of the business direction when you see that your current business is not going anywhere or not producing the results that you, you are expecting. And then you can see others, that you detected others, exactly. right? Uh, in, in this case, it was uh, an easy, or relatively easy decision because uh, we had the, both business already ongoing on the, on the company and we clearly uh, detect that one, one of these was having much more uh, traction? scalability and traction than the other and on the other way it was also obvious that we were not uh, very competitive uh -huh. especially with uh, small teams that have no uh, additional indirect cost it was very difficult to to, to be uh, competitive and to have a return of, of investment in this direction so we had a, a decision and two paths and it was very clear at that moment I think in uh, I think the concept of piloting is not always that easy as it was for, for us at okay. that moment, I think. But sometimes you, you need to take decisions that are, uh, that where you need to, you have a higher risk. Yeah. And, and, and in our case, we were already developing the mobile robotics business inside, so we, we knew that it was uh, working. Successfully. Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, well but I, I think that in, in that case is because you, you did your homework properly so you were trying some other lines and then detecting the one that is really producing some traction and also detecting the ones that are not going and that, that you can see that you are not competitive so that's that's uh, that requires an exercise of humility and, and analysis of uh, oneself in order to to decide right and say oh we started this but we have to abandon this idea and the other one is showing better results let's push on that direction yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's something that uh, you with uh, i think you need to to do several times in the in the life of a company that you yes uh, at different levels possibly and uh, different uh, uh, decisions but this kind of uh, up to certain level piloting even uh, even not uh, not in a drastically direction as, in, as it was done in this case, but in some uh, lower uh, level decisions of uh, what uh, what path you need to cut, and yes, you need to, to follow. This needs to be done uh, more or less regularly. Regularly, yes, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's the concept of pivoting that I don't, I haven't explained it, but basically means on changing the business of your company so you are trying to build your startup and trying to sell this product but you see from the market that there is not acceptance of the mark of that product then you have to you you can still insist on that or maybe because of some information from the market and you are paying attention you can see that oh this is not going to be accepted but if we change in this direction it looks like there is more interest on that direction so let's try and then change our product into that other direction that change is from the main business it's called pivoting okay and requires a lot of uh, as i mentioned a lot of courage also because you are abandoning your your previous established idea into another that is not sure even if the data shows some interest but is not sure that is going to work it's not going to work well done. So then you, you mentioned also that you have done so several other pivots uh, uh, 
along well, their life. Well, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, you have to take some decisions. Uh, and, uh, Steve Jobs said that uh, he was more proud of uh, what he didn't do than of what he did. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. And yeah, that's uh, that you 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 need to decide at some point that you when you start you have a lot of um, uh, options options and you you are opening and maybe spreading all the, the possibilities you have and. We have a wide uh, tree of opportunities. Yeah, opportunity, yeah. And then uh, it is uh, at that time and then now uh, even it's even worse because there's a lot of capital and it is very, it, it's difficult to be competitive even in a single, you can be good at one or two uh, things, but you cannot uh, try to, uh, to, to master yeah, to, to master in all all the possible yeah. parts of the tree, so you need to continuously uh, cut this tree <laughs> yeah. and, and decide to continue only on a few yeah. of the of the possibilities you have, and that has been done continuously. Continually, exactly. Yeah. So it's uh, the concept of focusing that we were discussing during uh, lunch today, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There, there are some reasons, a lot of reasons for this, but one one is that. Uh, that this uh, business uh, has a lot of uh, capital investment, and this capital normally tries to attack one single uh, leaf of this tree, and it is a strong investment in one single possibility, and so it is impossible that you are addressing several of these opportunities at the same time and try to be competitive with this huge amount of capital that is behind. So it's something that regularly needs to be done, mm -hmm. and you have to consider now uh, continuously what what are what are the investments what are, what are the targets of uh, what is uh, supposed to be in stealth mode behind and what is uh, what are what, what does the market expect to grow more and mm -hmm. yeah it, it's a it's still a continuous uh, difficult it's uh, difficult yeah, yeah yeah and you have to be paying attention all the time uh, to what is outside how the market reacts to your products out there yes, it's, co it's complex mm -hmm. so yeah. I, I like the the concept that you mentioned because my question was only about have you pivot at any time but you have expanded this concept into hey yeah you you, you will have to pivot now and then later and once your business is established you will have to keep doing pivot all, all the time maybe this concept was not that dynamic in the past but yeah currently I mean, currently I and mean, in service robotics it's a highly dynamic environment and this needs to be done, I think, continuously. continuously. Okay, yeah. great. Good lesson here, uh, listeners of the podcast. Then another question, let me see here. Is, um, um, okay, so if I have understood correctly your business model of your company, so you have kind of two parts. One is the selling of robots for other people that needs for different reasons. And another one is to do projects based on service robots. Yes. And can you more or less explain us uh, yes. which one is the, the, the biggest part of your company or you, yes. do you split equally? Yes. No, uh, approximately, it depends from year to year. Uh -huh. But uh, generally speaking, about 60% uh, of our income comes from the selling of products. Uh -huh. And these are general purpose mobile, uh, autonomous mobile robots and general purpose mobile manipulators. Uh -huh. And we sell these uh, products to different uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there can be system integrators that use the robot to solve a specific uh, application. But we have also an important number of early adopters and uh, companies also uh, Maybe multinational companies that have R&D departments, but uh, R&D, public R&D, like uh, universities, research centers, also some military research. So we have a wide uh, spread of, of customers, but we sell our products as a general purpose machine mm. that can be uh, customized for the specific application in the same way as a robot arm manufacturer uh, sells his arm uh, for uh, for any specific application, so yeah. uh, they are as a general purpose machine that can be used for handling or for drilling or for welding or 
that's our also our vision of the of the product for cooking yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the cooking there is. Yes, we, we there have, are there is an application. We, we have sold <laughs> robots for cooking. For cooking, yeah. Exactly. yeah. So that that's uh, the, the the good thing of this uh, of this concept that the power of this concept of the general purpose machines. And then we have a second part of our business that is the development of projects. Uh -huh. And uh, here we have a specific verticals where we have been successful, and one is uh, inspection robotics, uh, robots for inspection and maintenance. We have uh, robots for, uh, in particular, in, in electric uh, um, electricity companies. We have uh, several applications for, for uh, robotic inspection or infrastructure inspection. Uh, then we have um, applications in transport, mainly indoor, but industrial transport. And then uh, we have some applications in mobile manipulation that is a market that is at this moment uh, starting. It is in a, in a very early stage. We have uh, customers of mobile manipulators that are early adopters, but uh, we have uh, we are seeing at this moment uh, the growing of the, of the industrial applications where mobile manipulation can be applied effectively and uh, realistic. And yeah, in all these uh, cases, we provide a solution that is a turnkey solution. We, we develop, we provide the robots that is that are based on our robots, mm -hmm. our standard products, and we provide the turnkey project. The turnkey project? What, is, what do you mean? The turnkey project is that the, 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 the you, you, it, it comes from the, the concept of giving the, the customer the keys so that he ah, can, okay, that he, okay. That customer does not need to, <laughs> to uh, do anything, to do part, any part of the project. Uh. He just uh, expects you that you develop everything from the start to the end. And okay, in that case, yeah, yeah, we, 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 yeah just in, in this business model, we, we are strong in, um, in some uh, specific verticals, but in our vision, um, we expect still to, to do this in order to improve the general purpose machine. That means that uh, we are doing this uh, with the objective of uh, adding capabilities to the, to the robots that we sell as general purpose machine, not with the idea of uh, pivoting into these uh, uh -huh. areas. Sectors, yeah, sectors yeah, 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 the, I the, see. Uh, that we see as an opportunity and we have done a lot of money and I think probably in maintenance, inspection and maintenance, we are one of the European companies that has uh, done probably more money, but, uh, but we, we still see the most uh, scalable uh, possibility the general purpose mobile robot and mobile manipulation. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Um, I'm very interested. I like very much the mobile manipulators. Uh, for those of the audience that doesn't know what that means, it means a robot which is based on a mobile base that can move around space and then some uh, arm, robotic arm on top that allows one or two or several, it depends, that allow to grasp uh, stuff in some way and, and leave the stuff somewhere else. It's uh, that the concept of mobile manipulators. And, and then I didn't know that was one with big expectations at present because I, I feel that they are very limited at present you're, yet. You're right. Um, Probably only software is the is the yeah. current, uh, limitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The software yeah. is the limitation from the from the technology point of view. I, I know that from the, from the mechatronics point of view, uh, this machine is uh, already robust and uh, is something that uh, can be installed. But it has some um, limitations in terms of of software. So there are different enablers for this uh, to come through. But there are some forecasts that say that one in ten robots uh, will be sold as a mobile manipulation solution, mm. and one in ten uh, for the collaborative robot market that is uh, continuously growing. In the last year, I think more than twenty percent is a very it's a, a lot very, very large, a large number. market. Yes. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So for all of you that are yeah. there listening and thinking about building your startup then take this information into consideration then um, uh, let me let me talk about the the other question is uh, 
So all your robots are ROS based. Oh, yes, yes. All all of them. Yes. Yeah. And then yeah. how many of them are ROS two based? Zero. <laughs> yes, yes. That, okay. Yeah, now I think the, the, we we tend to use the most popular distribution uh -huh. at at the time. Um, we in the past we we did not. Uh, we were probably more advanced than the than the standard uh, distribution, but we had uh, experienced the uh, lack of documentation. Yeah. Uh, several problems that you have when you start using a distro that does not many users. And so after some time moving from version to version, we decided to to move when the majority of the community moves to a specific version. Yeah, makes sense. And and that is as at this moment our strategy. And probably according to our roadmap we expect that this will happen in two thousand twenty two. And we expect to do that at that moment. So to change, you mean to change to ROS2? Yes. Okay, okay. So that's those are your plans. But ROS2 has uh, many versions already. So we are about to have the version G, uh, which is no, ROS2... I don't remember. Uh, Guacamole, I don't know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Whatever the name. So we are at, at present. The, the long-term support is called ROS2Foxy. And uh, then, uh, and ROS2 has uh, several advantages for, for, especially for products. And have you done any experiment on those? We, we have done some tests. So, yeah. But uh, when we understand the clear advantages mm -hmm. of uh, what is respect to the limitations of the middleware, uh, especially when you need to do some uh, network communication, yes. cloud robotics related uh, functionality or uh, cloud computation, and a lot of things that will be uh, enhanced by ROS2. Mm -hmm. But we still have this uh, limitation that we want to keep our strategy to move with the with, with the community. community. Now yeah. I see, I see. Yeah. And then the main point here is that the community is not uh, following ROS2 massively it, right it, now. It will, it will come. It will, it will. It will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of but, course, but, definitely. But uh, at this moment, it, it, is, it is not. It is still not. It's still not. Yeah, yeah that, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And then after all, we are companies and we need to do business and we need to go where the money is because we have to pay a lot of salaries. So I understand you perfectly, your, your position. So at the construct, we, we try to do the, the same things. Mm -hmm. But uh, in our case, we have to provide training to the people. For the and we have to be at the latest, yeah, uh, yeah, you yes, know, it's, it's different. You have to, to be from this point of view at the state of the art, a state of the art, exactly. And, uh, exactly. To provide what uh, people will use in the next uh, months, months. Or maybe next year, yeah, exactly. So you have to be uh, one step beyond, but we, we don't, we yeah, 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 yeah. We need to, uh, to, to do that in the right moment, at the right moment, yes. Yeah. And timing is, is very important, actually. I think it, timing is, is everything. Uh, timing is everything. It's like uh, yeah, but there the, is uh, there is this quote. I don't remember exactly from Bruce Lee. You know that the that the perfect timing is is perfect because even if you you throw your punch very well done, perfectly with all the power, a lot of strength and so on, but then you launch it uh, half a second before, then it. Cannot hit cannot. the target or later, you know. So it cannot hit. So timing is everything at the well, end. I, I agree yeah. with this. And, <laughs> Great. And in this case, it's just to 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 reduce your your resources. Yes. If, if you do that too early, you you will double your resources to reach the same result. Yes. And that's that, that's the reason we we do that at the moment. It it is necessary. Yes. Perfect. Make makes sense. Makes sense. And well, I have a question here that is, is if you have any product that is not ROS based. But yes, yeah, uh, yeah. We, we have a few uh, robots we developed for industry, but that's a really strange uh, case. Yeah, and uh, for some, this, this kind of the tethered robots that are, that, are, that are connected with a cable. Ah, okay. That okay. are mainly teleoperated yeah. robots that have uh, low degrees of autonomy. Mm -hmm. And we have, for example, one for 
cleaning the bottom of a nuclear from the, of the of the pool of a nuclear power plant. Wow! Uh, and this kind of robot, uh, this this uh, is not ROS based. Uh -huh. or we have some uh, some examples as this one, or one for metal spraying, also for pipes, or but this type of uh, of simple robots. We have some that are not uh, ROS based. Yeah, a few, but very few, okay. very few, I would say. Yeah, okay, yeah, maybe because it, so they are so simple that you don't need to over complexify the the, the yeah. robot, right? Yes, yes. In some cases, that the, also the computational power is very low, and uh, this also uh, from the hardware architecture is not easy to adapt, and and also there's there's no added value from the customer's perspective yeah, or what yeah, they are going to use. Is uh, just a pure teleoperation, or they just need to see the camera and operate one and start one process. And uh, this is a, a specific case where there is no autonomy. And I think that the the great added value of ROS is when the robot becomes autonomous. That that's when yeah. when there is a difference. The ro yeah, ROS yeah, makes yes. a difference. Anyway, I I from my uh, preference, I I would even in those cases have developed it ROS based, but <laughs> There are some cases where the requirements of the customer are not targeting this, and then you need to, to cope with this. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, I understand. OK, another question is, do you have recently launched a new robot, which is called the RB Boggy, which is a collaborative robot for outdoor transport in industry? So I would like to ask you a few questions. So what is a collaborative robot? And what is the main purpose of that B RB boggy robot of yours? OK, so first, a collaborative robot is a robot that has been uh, designed to share uh, his uh, workspace with uh, human operators and also also to, to interact with, with them. OK. So um, if you go to an industrial robot arm, it has to operate on uh, protected by fences and with some safety systems. Uh, a collaborative robot arm does not need to be protected by this, uh, by this kind of uh, safety solutions mm -hmm. unless the, the tool he's using is, is dangerous uh, itself. And then uh, if you apply this concept to a mobile robot, a collaborative mobile robot is a robot that, in, that can uh, share his uh, space with uh, with the human operators and do something together, but uh, you can extend this concept to extra functions that the collaborative robot can do. For example, uh, identifying humans or uh, having advanced functions in human robot interaction, like mm. uh, voice commanding or uh, features or characteristics like uh, person following or this type of extra functionality that is um, from the autonomy autonomy point of view more complex than the traditional AGVs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, uh, with respect to the robot, the uh, RB Bogey, uh, we are targeting um, transport applications, indoor and outdoor, and also uh, mobile manipulation applications, indoor and outdoor. Mm. Okay. Yeah. But the RB Bogey does has a manipulator on top? Uh, it's an oh. option. Ah, uh, it's as, an option, as, okay. As most of our platforms, we, we sell them with or without arm, they are modular, so uh -huh. you can add uh, specific sensor sets, but also normally you can add a robot arm and get uh, from the same machine a mobile manipulator. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, it's because the one that I saw downstairs today, this morning, yeah. it was without the arm, yeah. and then I and also on the yeah. newsletters that you sent us, yeah. it didn't have an, an arm. Yes, it's but we, we have sold also with with arm, and maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe okay. today there was not, no, no, it was not, okay, it was not there, but uh, it's uh, okay, okay, we were selling okay. it also with, uh, with the arm. Okay. Even we have sold with uh, two arm together. The, with two with arms. A dual arm configuration. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And this one uh, RB Boggy is for indoor or for outdoors? It, it, it is. It can operate in and outdoor. An outdoor. Ah, okay. It, it can operate in both. Both. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. It okay. has a standard higher mobility than the standard uh, AMR. Yes. So it can really. Uh, it, it's clear advantage is operating outdoor, mm -hmm. but it can operate indoor and outdoor. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Okay, then, uh, um, and uh, this RB Boggy, what is its uh, target market? Y yeah, 
uh, applications in transport, uh, in transport? Uh, different applications of, of transport. Oh, uh, so you mean it could be, for example, inside a, a warehouse? It can be inside uh, a warehouse. It can be between industrial buildings. Industrial, between, exactly, because it can go Different from... facilities, mm -hmm. or uh, it can be a last mile logistics application. Uh -huh. It can be applications in uh, uh, what is called um, um, peri-urban areas. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, Pedestrian areas. Yes, exactly. Where, where there, there are no cars and then, but also this kind of uh, operations of transport mm -hmm. in this kind of environment. Okay. So yeah. Very different applications. Okay. Different okay. Different. I'm asking you about that because mm -hmm. um, when I talk to the audience about building their own startup, what I tell you is that they should start with the minimum complexity as possible. So many of the people, they send me their, their ideas for the startups. They say, oh, I'm going to do, for example, a delivery robot that delivers, imagine uh, that delivers the, the, the mail here on this industrial area that we are. So is the, let's say that is the post office that is delivering mm. the mail by this uh, RB buggy, by using your, your, for example, as an application that could be. Then the, the, the audience usually, many of them, they think, oh, so I'm going to design the robot and then it's going to have these wheels because it has to go through this type of terrain and then I will put these sensors. And then what I tell them is, wait, don't start building everything. You can do that later if your product is a success. But first you need to understand if your product is a success, start fast by a platform that is already made and then you know that it works and then you put your application of this on top of it fully agree with you that uh, that this is a traditional error and uh, it's it's called reinventing the wheel yeah reinvent it, exactly <laughs> it, it happens uh, again and again and, again, and, again. and um, many startups that repeat and and want to to complete the development uh, of everything, uh, of, of everything, when when this is really not adding value to the to the business. No, and I would uh, I fully agree with you that you have to focus on on trying to uh, test and do a fast uh, iteration uh, and yeah, a fast integration and a, a fast uh, demonstration of of the feasibility of your concept. Of the idea, and, uh, yeah. That this is much more important than trying to control uh, the, the whole technology that is inside the, the, such a robot from, from the start because the, also it, it will take uh, a lot of money and a lot of time mm -hmm. and finally you will be uh, at the starting point that you would have been but uh, three, five years later. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, yeah. in, in this uh, dynamic environment where we are, this is not adding any value. Yeah, and so it can kill you very fast. And, yeah. But, but I, I have seen this uh, a lot of times. Yes. And, and even uh, in areas where, where the, the, the market is absolutely saturated, like, uh, for example, indoor AMRs for logistics is a clearly saturated uh, market. But you still can see uh, startups that are uh, creating their, their own, own AMR, targeting the logistics in indoor environments. For, and I... I Honestly, I don't, don't understand uh, why, uh, why are people uh, thinking in this way. Honestly uh -huh. speaking, I, I cannot. I, ha I have my own theory uh, because I have talked to some of them. And actually, I have a discussion with even one company that was even developing his own uh, robotics programming framework. So they, they yeah, didn't that's, want that's to, a, and yeah. uh, let me give you an example, mm -hmm. the Vector robot. Do you know the Vector robot? It's a small robot, it's very mm -hmm. cute robot, very mm -hmm. cute, super cool. Mm -hmm. It's very small and you can use for many experiments and also as a companion, also e even if you want. Mm -hmm. But they, they reinvented the whole framework. Of course, the, the company went bankrupt and closed and I don't know what is happening. I think that now has a second life after being closed for one year or more. Uh, somebody is taking the IP and doing something, but I don't know. But the company went bankrupt of this. Then this other one that I was discussing about not building their own ROS framework, 
So the, usually the idea behind that is that they think that they can do it better. And I, I do agree on that. I do agree. So I'm Maybe. pretty sure that you can do better than the other people. I'm sure. I'm not doubting this. The only problem is the costs of demonstrating that. So it's like the purpose is to demonstrate that they can do better or something like that. Or maybe not understanding the, the value of, of what is uh, already there. Uh, because uh, <clears throat> okay, if you see a lot of things that, okay, I, this, uh, I, I could develop this myself, but, yeah. but um, there is, a, as you say, a so high cost yeah. that it, it does not make sense. To, it, doesn't to, make, it doesn't make sense. To go in this direction, when you are, especially when you are trying to do a startup. Mm -hmm. If you have unlimited resources and you really have exactly. behind you uh, hundreds of millions, then maybe you can do what you want. But if, if you, the, the, the characteristic of a startup is that the resources are limited. Mm -hmm. And you normally have to do as best as you can with the resources you have. And, that and in a fast time. This type of uh, uh, development that is uh, creating or using a lot of effort in a direction that uh, to create something that is already in the market. Yeah. And yeah, I have seen this several, several times. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. So yeah. lesson here for the audience, then start with what is already built and use it as your block for your, to put your, your idea, your value on top of it. You don't need to build your computer, computer from scratch. You can buy one and then start programming. Mm -hmm. it's, it's faster. Exactly. Uh, okay, then. So, how is the process in your company to decide to launch a new robot? For example, you, you have launched this one, RB Boggy, yeah. and but why? How how do you decide? Oh, let's launch an RB Boggy. <laughs> well, in the more traditional process, you should get feedback from the marketing department that uh, should tell you that okay, market is willing to have this and uh, our current product range does not fulfill what is in the market that uh, this does not work like this uh, normally mm -hmm. you you get feedback from uh, different commercial actions and at some maybe at some uh, customer is requiring several units that you cannot fulfill with the product with your product range mm -hmm. and, and maybe uh, you can adapt some of the products because this is uh, for us is uh, easier than, than than for a company that is starting because in our case we reuse uh, the complete architecture. So even you see uh, RB Boggy uh, from the from the software and mechatronics point of view, uh, what is inside is coming from the rest of the families. It, uh -huh. it is the same product. So we have more so to say. My, a higher degree of flexibility to adapt uh, one robot to a new uh, environment, a new application, and that's where we normally, how we normally start. We have, uh, then we also do some analysis. We normally don't do this. Uh, we did it in the, in the past, but now we never do this when we don't feel that there is a scalability opportunity. Okay. So if we are going to create a new machine that we feel. It has no not uh, market, or we are going to manufacture less than 30, 50 units of these. We normally don't uh, do that. Don't or, create a new product. Or we sell this as a project that is expensive. Uh -huh. That is okay. That we are, okay. We are going to use resources in this, but this has no not a clear scalability. And then let let's do let's get some uh, profit of of this. That's uh, how we normally. Uh -huh. And then finally, the, here there is some part that is an intuitive decision. Uh -huh. you, really, you really don't know when you start a new product how many units are you, you are going to sell. But you can have the feeling, that, uh, after some years, you will have the feeling of what can be successful and what can not. Not. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Some intuition and... Yeah, it's based on your experience of so many years. Yes, and, and information, you have to be well documented and well informed of what is in the market. In, yes, so what, what the market needs because of those feedback. And then in that case, because you have so many clients already and you have 
you are working with them so many projects then you can get this feedback and suggestions no? in our case we also do that we, yes. we have the the, the yes. feedback yes. from the you, you have to be in close contact with your market yes very one uh, you know, in a maxima, no? in yes way, is a, a, a yeah. like a, a yeah. golden rule golden rule is you know your market you need to know your market and know, knowing your market means that you have to be in close contact with all your customers yes. and understand their needs they understand their needs exactly. exactly exactly that's a very important lesson also for startup builders then okay then what is the role of simulations in your development yes um, here i would mention two two uh, very important roles one is uh, in the process of uh, designing the machines and uh, we we use simulation in order to understand the behavior of the robot before it's been produced and this is a type of uh, way to tune parameters mm. select some of the parameters test some of the parameters and it makes the, the design process cheaper because you reduce a lot of uh, tests that would be done in the real with real parts that you simulate and then they, for this we use different levels of simulation from the cat provided simulators but also gazebo uh -huh. and other, other simulators and this is one one very strong part where we use simulation then the other part where you use simulation and it's also very important is uh, when you are doing turnkey projects and service robotics projects uh, the when normally the, the process here is that the complete process is simulated before it is uh, programmed on the real robot uh -huh. so we we have interfaces where, where the, the programs operate with a simulated robot in this with the same interface as they operate with the real robot so we can reproduce the environment and test the complete system hmm. and this is a cheap way and effective way to debug yeah that you really can uh, detect especially the processes that take a uh, uh, long very long uh, for example robots that uh, have scheduled for several weeks and that uh, have to run uh, maybe 40 80 hours per week and uh, there are some bugs in the program that appear yeah uh, and if you have to do all this testing in the real robot uh, the, the cost of this is is too high so yeah simulation is the only way to cope with this complexity in an effective way yeah because you can launch several simulations at the same time exactly. different yeah. conditions exactly. faster yeah. than real yeah. time right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, that's it uh -huh. Okay, yeah, simulations are very, very important for, yeah. for that. And, um, okay, so let me see. Um, so for the, the guys in the audience that are thinking about building their own startup, so yeah. how do you think that is the, uh, the, the competition in the robotics market going? So the competition is becoming stronger and stronger, but uh, this means also that there is a there is a market. Yeah, there is a, a lot of uh, expectations in in this market, but it is obvious that this market is already growing. If you go to service robotics, uh, the, if you go to, to the statistics of the last years, it is growing in more than twenty percent per year in some areas. So it is a growing market, and the, the, the good thing is that the market is there and it, it will be a huge market. The bad thing is that the, there is a lot of uh, capital and yeah, you, you, will, you may find uh, a lot of competition if you don't uh, do the, the right, or the right uh, choice or the, the right bet. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. And also, that, uh, as you mentioned, that the competition is growing, it's getting tougher and tougher then the best moment to start is now. So if you are th considering that, then start now, because it's going to be more difficult in one month, two months, one year, two years, right? Yes, you're right. <laughs> uh, the, the service robotics market is really starting 
uh, now. Yeah. We have been here for a long, long time, but uh, we were in a market that was a, a fairly adopters market, and the the real market is starting now. Maybe it is a it's a good time to start, but also uh, one have to to think about the that there there are maybe too many uh, expectations in this market, and at some point it can become some kind of, uh, of deception uh, of, no, of bubble a bubble, of, of bubble yeah, okay a bubble. yeah right but uh, yeah many fake but, uh, promises uh, uh, yes <laughs> okay maybe we can do one chapter about that about fake promises in the future okay uh, then another question is uh, and then do you think that in this growing market with uh, growing competition uh, using developing robots with ROS is an advantage or disadvantage what do you think well, ROS is a clear advantage uh, it's uh, you you have to you have to think of companies like uh, uh, fetch robotics clear path amir they are all using ROS and the reason is that the the, the, the standard in service robotics. So I, I would not even consider uh, an alternative. Mm -hmm. It is the, the, the standard, the de facto standard. And as we have discussed, it does not make sense to reinvent something that is working so well and that has so, a so great community of uh, contributors. So I definitely recommend to use ROS. But this is only part, a part, it's a part of the, yeah, yeah, of the of whole course. architecture. So you need to, to think how to combine this with the rest of the of the systems you will, you will need. But definitely, I recommend to, to use it. It is a clear advantage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do agree. I do agree. And uh, and uh, what what do you think about the China market of robotics? Since you have some experience on it, can you give us some hints? Well, the the Chinese government is investing uh, strongly in robotics. They consider robotics a strategic area, and they have been investing in the last years in in both academic but also industrial. They have created some industrial parks that are only uh, uh, oriented or accepting companies that are working with uh, with robotics, and okay, uh, it we expect a strong competition coming from China in the in the next years, and at this moment uh, the the number of companies in service robotics in Europe is higher than in China and higher than the United States. But if you analyze the level of investment, uh, it is the opposite. Uh, in Europe, is the the region where less is invested in mm -hmm. service robotics companies. So uh, we, up to a certain level, we we have uh, to be aware that this competition will come, and that it will be true in in the next years. In the next years, yeah. yes. Yeah, because even if we have now the larger number of startups based on robotics or startup of robotics with products, uh, then the level of investment is is like the the growing uh, the growing uh, water the the water that is put in into the 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 field to grow the the fields right and then it's this water is a lot more in China and yeah, the United States right. so they are going to come after here and overtake this leadership from Europe any of those that that's probably a, that what one happen. of the options one, one of the what is possible what it looks as the most probable probable yeah, yeah. likely yes okay and then one final question. So what would you advise to those ROS developers out there that want to create their own startups based on ROS? Well, I, I would recommend to definitely to use ROS, in particular ROS2. If they are starting right now, 
hmm. to start with uh, what would be the next uh, standard in, in service robotics that will be ROS2 and uh, to learn as much as possible uh, of, of, the, of the ROS architecture if possible using the construct thank you for the commercial <laughs> thank you yeah, okay. no and uh, well that, that that's my recommendation that uh, uh, learn explore what others are doing learn from all the the, the great uh, open source packages that are being developed and the great community and try to contribute also to this community mm. in, in your possibilities mm -hmm. that that's it okay okay thank you roberto thank you very thank much you. and uh, where can people find you and your company well uh, yeah in, in the internet in w at uh, robotnik.eu eu okay dot yeah. eu and of, of european union and that's uh, we have also uh, LinkedIn or Facebook channel, but they okay. can find us in the in the website. Yeah. Okay, I will put a link in the show notes about all those products that we have managed and other informations that we have been talking along the the podcast, as well as the uh, link to your company webpage and personal LinkedIn profile in case that somebody in the audience wants to ask you, contact you, and ask yeah. you uh, any additional question or so on. Okay, so thank you very much, Roberto, for thank coming second time, and let's wait for the third one. Okay. 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 Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.